Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and today we're going to continue our series that looks at the various roles of Star's vehicles by going onto the Republic and looking at their larger ships. Roughly a millennia before the Clone Wars, thousands of years of devastating conflict between the Jedi-backed Republic and the Sith-backed factions had finally come to an end with the destruction of the Brotherhood of Darkness at the Seventh Battle of Rusan. The galaxy was tired of the constant chaos and fighting, and Chancellor Taras Valorum helped push for the Rusan Reformation, which demilitarized the Jedi-led Army of the Light and returned the Order back to peacekeeping duties under the supervision of the Supreme Chancellor and Judicial Department. This also led to the dissolution of the Republic Navy and also led to a period of time known as the Golden Age of the Old Republic. Centuries later, Darth Plagueis and his protege Darth Sidious planned on taking over the galaxy by manipulating the Republic's governing system. A large part of their plan was creating a huge military force which could back their authoritarian ruling style. The Ruzan Reformation forced Palpatine and Plagueis to secretly develop an army outside the view of the Republic government. It was relatively easy for Count Dooku and Darth Sidious to keep the Kaminoan cloning program a secret from the rest of the galaxy. Only individuals within the cloning community probably have heard of the Kaminoans. They are quite xenophobic and isolationist. All it took was a simple deletion from the Republic archive maps and all of a sudden Kamino didn't exist anymore. And you had a massive secret army in production. But in order to get those clones to the battlefield safely, the Republic also needed starships. Massive battleships had been outlawed by the Rusan Reformation, so Palpatine and Darth Plagueis had to figure out a better way of creating a massive armada. Only a few worlds in the galaxy had the industrial capability to produce capital-sized ships, and a project to create a fleet to protect the galaxy would require a massive amount of energy, raw materials, and manpower, something that would be pretty hard to hide. But as always, good old Palpy McScrumface found a way. A few ways to prepare the galaxy for war. One of the most essential vessels that needed to be built by the opening battle of the Clone Wars was a transport vessel for all the clones. It didn't matter if the Republic had more than a quarter million troops ready to fight on Geonosis if they didn't have a way to get there. Now, Darth Sidious could have selected some smaller, lesser known outer rim shipyard to produce these transports and just hope that they would be able to hide this very secretive project. But ultimately, Palpatine decides to go with Quat Drive Yards, the largest military shipbuilder in the galaxy. Now, any construction on Quat would easily be discovered by the media and Republic civilians living there. So instead, Quat Drive Yards found a workaround. You see, around 800 years earlier, the mineral-rich world of Rothana had been discovered in wild space and had been sold to Quat Drive Yards. In the centuries afterwards, Quat Drive Yards established a subsidiary company known as Rothana Heavy Engineering on Rothana. A network of mines, factories, and shipyards have been built on the planet, creating a self-sustained shipyard. This site became the location of most of Quat Yard's most secretive projects. It was here that the Acclimator class assault ship, along with the all-terrain tactical enforcer, low-altitude assault transport, and many other vehicles were first developed and tested for the clone army. And so, at the first battle of Geonosis, only vehicles and vessels that had been designed and produced on Rothana were available for the clone army. The Acclimator class assault ship was a 750 meter long transport designed to carry and house 16,000 clone troopers, along with several LAATs and ATTEs. A dozen of these ships carried almost 200,000 clones safely to the planet of Geonosis. Luckily, they caught the Geonosians by surprise, and there were hardly any defenses in place in orbit to take down these acclimator vessels. Despite their large size, they were very lightly shielded and had very few armaments on them. As a matter of fact, during the Battle of Ryloth, they were relatively easy to take down with anti-air cannons. Still, the acclimator was better than just the civilian transport, and it would serve the Republic well for the rest of the war, as long as it had an escort fleet with it. Unlike the Separatist Alliance or the Galactic Empire, the Republic only needed one capital ship to really win the war. I'm of course talking about the Venator-class Star Destroyer. This is perhaps one of the most versatile ships ever designed. At 1,137 meters, it was one of the largest capital ships capable of atmospheric operations at the time. This was important because the Venator-class Star Destroyer could carry around 2,000 troops, dozens of walkers, transports, gunships, and even prefabricated bases for deployment all of which could be loaded and offloaded from the ground, which made the whole process a lot easier and simpler. 
But perhaps what the Venator class Star Destroyer was known for was its massive hangar, which basically ran across the entire middle of the ship. This area could hold 192 V-Wings or V-19 Torrents and 192 Eta Actus Light Interceptors along with 36 ARC-170 fighters. At the bow of the ship, hyperspace docks could be released for away missions for the ships that weren't equipped with hyperdrives. One could say, with that many fighters being stored on board, the Venator-class Star Destroyer was more of a carrier than a typical ship of the line. And although the Venator-class relied heavily on its fighters to attack and defend, at close ranges the Venator could hold its own with its 8 heavy turbo laser turrets, 26 medium dual turbo lasers, and a variety of smaller weapons and placements. On the bottom of the ship there was another large hangar door that could accommodate an entire frigate. With so many hangars, the Venator-class Star Destroyer could easily dispel its entire complement of fighters within a few minutes, but at the same time, these gaps in the ship represented structural weaknesses and needed to be protected by point defense weapons and fighters. Luckily, the Venator featured a pretty powerful shield as well thanks to its powerful main reactor. Although the Venator-class Star Destroyer proved to be very effective for the Republic, mainly thanks to its massive amount of starfighters on board, the Republic lacked a true battleship that could trade fire with larger separate ships like the Providence-class or Subjugator-class at close range. This is where the Victory-class Star Destroyer comes into play. In many ways, the Victory class served as a template for all future Imperial Star Destroyers, introduced in the middle of the Clone Wars by Rendelli Star Drive and Quad Drive Yards. This ship was shorter than the Venator class at 900 meters, but much more heavily armed and armored. Featured 10 quad turbo laser batteries and 40 double turbo laser batteries. The deck of the ship was oriented in a more tiered setting, as would be common with all future Star Destroyers, to allow all the guns on the deck to fire on target without obstruction. The Victory performed incredibly well and was also very cost efficient, especially compared to later Imperial models that were a lot larger. The Victory class represented the future of the Republic, and the Dreadnought class represented the past of the Old Republic. The Dreadnought class was not a Dreadnought though, it was a heavy cruiser. Small by Clone Wars and Galactic Civil Wars period standards, this 600 meter compact ship had extremely powerful shields and armor and was very heavily armed. What made this ship unique as well was that the bridge was actually hidden within the hull of the ship, which makes a lot more sense than an exposed bridge that is placed on a strut on top of the ship that many Separatist Republic Imperial ships all had. And that was because the Dreadnought was a no-nonsense Mandalorian design that focused on function rather than aesthetics. Although it was primarily designed as a capital ship for planetary security forces, the judicial forces also used the Dreadnoughts as well. The ship was also used for deep space exploration. Any job where survivability was a big factor, a Dreadnought could be found. The Dreadnought was produced by Rendelli Star Drives, which was a corporation known for selling its blueprints to smaller shipyards and allowing them to produce their own versions of the ship, which meant that the Dreadnought came in many, many different versions. We looked at some of the larger ships in the Republic, but now we're going to look at some of the smaller ships, which were much more common and equally as important. The Peta-class frigate was widely used as a medium-sized ship for the Republic Navy that did everything from escorting larger ships to delivering medical supplies. Like the blockade runners that would be used during the Rebellion period, the Pelta-class was extremely modular and could carry troops, cargo, and even starfighters. At 282 meters long, it was small enough to fit in most space stations and even inside some larger Republic cruisers. Originally designed by Quad Drive Yards as a civilian ship, armored versions of the Pelta-class was used as assault craft that could harass and skirmish with enemy frigates and destroyers. Prior to the Clone Wars, the Consular class cruiser was used by diplomats and Jedi on official Republic business. These 115 meter long corvettes were very fast and heavily shielded for their size, but usually carried no armament, especially diplomatic versions of the ship. Engineered by Carillion Engineering Corporation, the Judicials also used the modified version armed with double turbo lasers and concussion missiles. Small enough to fit inside a Venator class Star Destroyer hangar, these small ships were excellent gunboats. They were small and maneuverable enough to chase down enemy fighters, but they also had enough punch to take out larger capital ships. The ship required a very small crew, which also made it an excellent choice for the budget-conscious Republic after the Rusan Reformation. Due to the demilitarization of the Republic, it was relatively hard for member states to create larger battleships. 
One planet that was able to skirt around regulations was Quad Drive Yards. Quad Drive Yards had long been an ally to the Republic and would later stay with the Core Worlds as other trade and corporate factions would join the Outer Rim CIS. This was why Quad Drive Yards was allowed to produce massive warships like the Procurator Class Star Battlecruiser and later the Mandator 1 and 2 Class Star Dreadnoughts for defending the extremely important Quad Orbital Shipyards. Although they rarely ventured out of the core regions away from Quat, the Manator II class star Dreadnought were technically under the command of Supreme Palpatine's Republic Navy. At around 8 kilometers long, it would be the inspiration for all future Imperial Star Destroyers, and the series would be brought back by the First Order in the form of the Manator IV class siege Dreadnought. So because of the Rusan Reformation, the Republic just didn't have a large variety of capital ships, and a lot of the smaller ships that they did use were kind of civilian ships that were modified for fighting. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.